Welcome to the Governance Podcast from the Centre for the Study of Governance and Society here at King's College, University of London. Uh, my name is Mark Pennington and I'm the Director of the Centre. I'm very pleased to have with us today Simon Kay from New Local, uh, formerly known as the New Local Government Network. The New Local have recently produced a very interesting policy report on Ostromnomics, um, which is really trying to apply uh, some of the ideas from Eleanor and Vincent Ostrom to look at aspects of a possible policy reform agenda in the UK and perhaps in other countries as well. Um, those of you who follow uh, our podcast will know that the work of the Ostroms is quite an important uh, stream of work in what our centre has been concerned with because of their focus on the relationship between formal and informal um, institutions of, of governance. So Simon, uh, welcome to you. It's great to have you with us today. Um, I wonder if we could start off just by you giving us a little bit of background about what kind of organization uh, New Local is. Yeah, absolutely, Mark. Thank you. And th thanks for having me. Um, New Local, uh, as you say, the artist formerly known as uh, New Local Government Network. Uh, we've just gone through a big, uh, a big renaming process, new website, new everything. Uh, it's, it's an interesting organization because it's not just a, a kind of traditional policy think tank in that sort of Westminster bubble sense. It's also a functioning network of around 60 local authorities around uh, the UK. We've just got our first Scottish member. We're interested in, in introducing a, a Welsh member as well uh, uh, really soon. Uh, so it's a UK wide organization and it's a kind of a practice network uh, with these really innovative innovative local government bodies, as well as other kind of corporate and intellectual partners. Uh, so we produce research in the in the fashion of a traditional think tank with an increasingly kind of national focus, actually, because we're trying to make the case for more localism, generally speaking, uh, to 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 the national scale, to national and central government. Uh, and at the same time, we sort of test and explore and find evidence by talking to that uh, wider network of case studies and, and innovative councils. So that's what New Local is all about. Okay, that's great. Um, so you've produced with New Local this, um, what I think is an excellent report on uh, Ostromnomics. I wonder if you could say a little bit about why um, and how that uh, New Local has actually become aware of the Ostrom's work. Is it something they've been aware of for some time and why are you now sort of moving forward with some of their ideas in, in the way that you set out in this report? Yeah, definitely. So this report, uh, the report's called uh, Think Big, Act Small, Eleanor Ostrom's uh, Radical Vision for Community Power. Okay, sorry, yeah. No, 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 not correct. I didn't know the name had changed. <laughs> uh, we, uh, yeah, the you, you're referring to the uh, to the original title called Astronomics. Yeah, uh, but I think uh, that got uh, that got shot down at a certain point, much to my uh, much to my chagrin. Actually, at one point, it was going to be called Commons People, as in uh, reference to the <laughs> pulp song. I, I thought that was a bit clever, but no oh, one the else. Pop, the, pop, the pulp song. <laughs> exactly, Commons People. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, no one else thought that was funny, uh, <laughs> so that was that for the, for that idea. Um, no, so how did how did New Local start getting interested uh, in in the work of, in particular, Eleanor Ostrom? I must say, and actually, this is a good moment to say that I. I only managed to smuggle in really two references to Vincent Ostrom mm. in the entire report. Uh, Eleanor mm. Ostrom is very much the kind of character that we're building yeah. from here, uh, perhaps for, for, for obvious reasons. Uh, but obviously the work of Vincent Ostrom is incredibly important here too. Um, well, so in 2019, near the start of 2019, before I started working at, uh, at NLGN, now a new local, uh, a very important report was released uh, by them called The Community Paradigm. And central to that is this intellectual inspiration argument. Uh, so this is a report that works through the idea of there being four huge stages in the nature of public services and public policy uh, in sort of early modern to modern uh, British history. Uh, the first is a sort of civic paradigm that kind of revolves around the, the core institutions rather than state provision. So, you know, where, where you had uh, public services that were commissioned and organized by church groups in quite an informal way that were different from place to place. Can you hear a baby crying in the background? That would be my baby crying in the background. Um, do, we'll, we'll edit this a little bit, won't we, Irina? Oh, she's not there. Uh, we'll have to edit that a bit. Sorry about that. 
Uh, so there was a civic paradigm first. This was replaced at a certain point by what's sometimes referred to as the state paradigm. And that's how it's ex explained in, in the report, uh, where the state really kind of monopolized public service delivery, particularly in that kind of aftermath of the Second World War. This in turn, and this is a very familiar narrative to people talking about public policy in the UK, was sort of altered and shifted in the wake of Thatcherism where a kind of market paradigm came into play. And the fourth paradigm that's being sort of recommended and espoused by this document is called the community paradigm, which sort of takes some attributes from that original civic paradigm and updates them in a kind of more democratic way uh, and uh, has a more complex view and says, well, of course there are, there are elements of the market and state paradigms of public service delivery and public policy design that are relevant and then that are needed. But actually systems are complex and what's missing in a lot of cases is people being able to exercise their autonomy, to take control of what matters to them. And as Ostrom said, uh, there are a lot of cases where when communities are allowed the kind of leeway to do this, the outcomes can improve too. So the community paradigm really plugs into that idea. But just how as how the market paradigm can point to someone like Milton Friedman, uh, the idea is that you need a kind of an intellectual heavyweight to help inform and make the case and point to when you're kind of making a, a kind of a national scale policy argument like that. So Eleanor Ostrom became a very kind of natural candidate for that role. And all of this was just a, just a couple of years ago that this thinking was going on uh, at, New, at New Local, long after Eleanor Ostrom had already passed away. Okay, no, that's, that's, that's very helpful uh, sort of context. We think about some of the ideas in the report. So obviously, as part of this community paradigm, um, you are pushing an agenda which is emphasizing very much the idea of decentralization, mm. of communities taking control um, over uh, about the way public services are delivered or the way assets are managed. Perhaps communities having the space sort of to craft their own hybrids between um, community provision markets or state provision or, or whatever. Mm. Um, what would you say though to the argument that, um, you know, in the UK people have been arguing for decentralization for many years. Um, there's lots of complaints in British government politics about over centralization. And yet the agenda never really seems to, the decentralization agenda never really seems to take root. Um, and in that case, what is it about the Austrian agenda you think that can somehow possibly make that happen? Is there, is there something different that they're saying that, that, that brings something new to that sort of uh, centralization, decentralization debate? Uh, yeah, well, brilliant question. And actually, I think I think there is something quite distinctive. Uh, and this is part of the reason why Austrian is such an, such an important focus for this work. Um, there's something different about her. Uh, and I think you can start to see the difference if you look at the way she had, it's been, it's been quite unusual to see proper engagements with her in UK policy uh, circles. But if you look at the way she's popularly understood and engaged with uh, uh, in the UK, what's really striking is the political range that she seems mm. to have in this country yeah. and actually elsewhere in the world. But let's focus on the UK. The two primary engagements with Eleanor Ostrom in this country, in the policy sphere that the average per, the average kind of market reader for this report would have already looked at would be David Green's book. Uh, and I think David Green is a, is a previous guest uh, of yours on this podcast, uh, which which essentially connects the, the common commoning agenda, as some people refer to it, mm -hmm. to the to the deep green ecological agenda uh, and and associates it in turn with with quite a radical view on all sorts of different ideas about how the economy should function. Uh, and, and so is, broadly speaking, a left wing engagement. And on the other side of the coin, we have uh, a series of papers from the IEA and Eleanor Ostrom, shortly before she died, gave a talk at the IEA. And the only think tank in the UK that regularly refers to or thinks about Eleanor Ostrom's work, apart from New Local, is the Institute for Econ Economic Affairs. Not a left-wing organisation, but really quite a market-interested and, and right-wing organisation, in, in, by most people's uh, summation. So you've got political range there. She has the capacity to appeal to a very broad range of, of, of interests from, you know, people who are interested in, in, in community ownership models on the left, people who are interested in sustainability 
in the environmentalist movement and, and combating climate change at the local level, to people who are interested in localism, in economic efficiency, and achieving more autonomy and less state intervention on the right. Now, if you can if you can navigate your way between the kind of the different interests that come with those positions, Eleanor Ostrom is a character who could motivate and help to sell to any political party, to any uh, set of interest groups, the idea of localism, the idea of decentralization, of subsidiarity. So that's the ambition here is to try and capture that, that really unique potential. Uh, and I think the, o- the other side of this is that not only is Eleanor Ostrom quite quite distinctive in her ability to appeal across a broad political spectrum. This is a moment in time, I would argue, where we have a a few different reasons to be more radical in our thinking about the constitutional fabric and the way that power is distributed and things are organized in the UK. First, the first time I made that argument, I was only talking about Brexit and all of the challenges it posed and all of the shake up it implied. But of course, since then, we've had the start of the COVID-19 and the continuation of the COVID-19 pandemic, one that has highlighted some of the dangers of centralism. Okay, that's great. So, so, I mean, so you would be, you would say, for example, that you think the Ostrom agenda in its capacity to appeal to people across the political spectrum is is different from, you know, what we heard a lot of in the late 1990s and the early 2000s um, during the the, the Tony Blair premiership in Britain. Mm. There's a lot of talk about stakeholderism Mm. participation, that this is something that maybe has aspects of that at the local level, but is also able to appeal across political groupings in a way that perhaps that agenda didn't. Yeah, I think so. And and it's and it offers so much more. It's so much richer than sort of stakeholderism or, or, or sort of uh, third wayism, if you like. Mm-hmm. And there's there's certainly some people who have read a bit of Ostrom or a bit about yep. Ostrom and who reduce these ideas to third wayism. Yeah. Oh, it's beyond markets and states. You mean it's like a compromise between mm-hmm. markets? No, no, no. It's it's actually a, a different functioning model. It has different uh, starting points and different assumptions about human behavior and interaction. Uh, and so it's it's richer and deeper, and it is quite a different way of thinking about organizing and structuring institutions. Well, you mentioned the term there, um, beyond markets and states, which is um, a very important theme in Ostrom's writings. Um, in fact, I think the, I can't remember whether this is a, very, I think her Nobel lecture, it was either entitled Beyond Markets, markets and States or Beyond Markets government regulation, something along those lines. It was, yeah. So could you say um, a little bit about what you think she means by that phrase, getting beyond markets and states, when we're thinking about some of the kind of practical policy type areas that that New Local is concerned with? Yeah, of course. So I think it's, I think the first thing to say is, is, (laughs) it's perhaps a slightly mundane point, but it's, it's not, to be beyond markets and states maybe the word to add is alone beyond Mm. markets and states only or alone Mm. ostrom wasn't saying no markets please Mm. she wasn't saying no state please she was Mm. saying that these are valid functional long-standing and often totally appropriate solutions to 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 principles and to and to uh, problems but that there are different categories of solution that also exist specifically the self-governance a solution that can operate at smaller scales and that can have a very different kind of impact and a different kind of set of conditions that go along with them. So to go beyond just markets and just states, and this chimes very well with, with a lot of the rest of the work we do at New Local because we're constant, as I said, we're talking about how there's an obsession with these polarized alternatives of yeah. markets and states. To go beyond them is really to say, well, what about scale? What if we were to say you, you, people should be more engaged people should be involved more in the decisions that most directly affect them. Because when you think that way, which can be quite difficult to arrive at from a a kind of a a universalist or a purely liberal point of view, uh, you actually start thinking differently about the stakes involved. People who have skin in the game react differently to problems. They might have more localized or, or tacit knowledge about the conditions that they experience every day. And it's that quotidian experience that can change the nature of the solutions they come up with. 
So instead of sort of farming out or transacting out or setting up a contract with some external provider, it's communities themselves who cooperate, create the conditions for kind of sustained engagement with each other, which is in many ways the tricky bit, and then arrive at solutions as a result. And I think that's what she meant by beyond markets and states. Well, let, let me let me give you my reading of it, which I think partly gels with that, but maybe there's maybe there's some some points of contestation as well. So I see what she's saying as that there are certain types of institutional solution to problems. Hmm. For example, for the management of public goods or common pool resources, or the delivery of what we traditionally think of as being public services, which you can't categorize as being based on a market mechanism or some kind of hierarchical state mechanism. It's, it's something that is simply not suited to that kind of terminology. Hmm. So um, if we're talking about um, an asset that's like a community business um, or some kind of common uh, park or something that's run by a, um, a friendly society or something of that kind. You can't describe that as a market solution, but neither can you describe it as a state solution. It's some other kind of model. Hmm. It's a hybrid. So I think that's one sense in which she uses the term beyond markets and states. But the other, I think, and maybe this is I don't know whether you would agree with this or not, but I think it's more to focus on what is the mechanism mechanism that helps us to choose what the mix between markets and states is. Mm. I think she has a model in which at the local level, um, it should be local actors that negotiate mm. the mix of institutions is, whether they are markets, states, or the kind of uh, community models that aren't easily categorizable or, or of the sort that I just described. The point is that local communities choose what that mix is themselves through their own decision-making practices. No, I, I strongly agree with that. Um, and actually one of the things I'm proud of in this report uh, is that we get to this idea of polycentricity and we get to mm -hmm. the idea that a diversity of approaches is really what should be explored here. One of the core values of increasing the autonomy and the, and the smaller scale at which solutions are found and, and, and our basic assumptions about that kind of that operative unit of decision making and solution finding in society is that you also have to, if you're going to do that properly, create the space for diversity to emerge in different places. And the diversity that, that emerges will sometimes look a lot like what we have now. Sometimes it'll look like, oh, well, we should just we should just uh, privatize this this asset. We should we should take this common pool resource and we should make sure that everyone has appropriate uh, control over it at a, at, a, at a personal level. Or sometimes it'll look like talking to the state in a different way, either the local state or the central state. And sometimes, yes, it'll look like these harder to define other solutions that you describe. Um, but the point is, we don't have uh, and we don't even think we need, this is the real problem, a discovery process for when these different approaches are most appropriate to solve the problems and to uh, address the challenges we face. We don't think we need it because the people on either side of this market state argument think they're right about how the, the solution should look. Instead of thinking, well, what we really need to do is have some kind of consistent way of allowing localized solutions that are sensitive to local conditions and allow people to arrive at, in an experimental way, good outcomes more fluidly. That's what we need. We need that, that rich fabric to emerge. So it's, it's really an argument there about the notion that there is no fixed boundary about what kind of institutional arrangement is appropriate for particular kinds of goods, that that is constantly moving. Mm. Uh, um, varying according to local circumstances. So we've got variety across communities about when particular institutions might be appropriate, but we've also got um, variety across time mm. that can change from one point in time to the next, which kind of institutions might work best in particular settings. Yes, exactly. And and you, you're right that to, to emphasize that, that it's a moving target over time as well, and not just in different places. So one of the reasons for that flexibility to be valuable is that from one day to another even, but probably over slightly longer time frames, something that's working quite well could cease mm. to work. The conditions, yeah. the most important conditions and variables that made it work could shift and new conditions could start to emerge. And in order to be responsive to that, I guess one of the core arguments here is you need to be making decisions that take into account the local knowledge that's far more responsive to those shifts mm in local in local conditions so if your demographics change 
if uh, yep. the material uh, value of and, and local asset shifts, if uh, if 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 something if something drastic happens in the global context that could affect localities in different ways in different places. The argument here, and this is, it's it's telling that this is an unusual thing to hear in the UK policy space. The argument here is it's appropriate to address these in slightly different or very different ways in different places because different places have different assets and different populations and mm -hmm. different sets of interests as a result. Well, I mean that that leads me on to you know what what I think is a sort of strange paradox about British politics, which is that. On the one hand, you do get uh, many people complaining, and we've seen this in the context of the response to the pandemic. Um, you get many people complaining that there is too much centralization. Mm. There is not enough decentralization or scope for community decision making in the UK. We're a very centralized country with many decisions made in Whitehall. Um, but at the same time, the minute you start to get local variety arising, mm. um, you know, you have people complaining that they don't like the fact that there are different outcomes in different places that we often get this phrase, the postcode lottery referred to that mm. people want there to be a uniformity of provision and of outcome um, when the localism agenda is pointing towards something else. So, I mean, how, how do you square that circle? I think, of, uh, um, that's, that's, sorry, go on, Mark. In, in terms of, you know, selling this, uh, if, you, if you're trying to sell a political product, People seem to want it, but they don't seem to want the the outcomes that go with it. Strangely, <laughs> no, I, it's it's peculiar, and I think it. I think there are there are several reasons why this mentality has emerged. Um, but people, like you say, people seem much more comfortable with the idea of universally undesirable outcomes than they do with the idea of localized undesirable outcomes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, there's a there's there's something I'm very sympathetic to in that view which is that if you have a totally localized system, uh, you'd imagine that one of the side effects of that, an undesirable side effect of that, would be places that places with less natural resources or places which have the short end of the stick in terms of luck, basically, will end up with worse outcomes overall mm -hmm. and more consistently. And I think that my personal view is that there is definitely a role for some kind of leveling approach that to create more kind of even starting points for different localities if you're to mm -hmm. pursue a real localized, a real subsidiarity approach. Um, I think that the, the aspect of the argument that I'm not very sympathetic to is the idea that the core value here should be a kind of abstracted universalism. Because I think once you've established, uh, and the evidence, as far as I'm aware, always establishes this, once you've established that outcomes are going to be generally worse when you take that leveling approach, you will in yeah. effect be leveling down to create equality between places, then actually there's very little moral basis for doing so. Uh, rather, it's trying. It's better to try and create the conditions where the flourishing can be propagated from one place to another, which takes us back to this idea of it being a discovery process, of it being experimentalism. Because one thing that can emerge from experimentalism is learning. Uh, it's not just going to be good for the one place that seizes on a good outcome. It could inspire and help to inform the experiment happening two towns over or on the other side of the country or on the other side of the yeah. planet. And unless different places are trying different things at different times, at different scales, using different kinds of institutional and governance forms, we're not going to find out what can work in some places. And the, the other place isn't going to learn, oh, well, we could try this here with the resources we have. So let me let me let me pursue this a little bit. So um, if, if I'm understanding you rightly, what, effectively what you're arguing for is there needs to be some leveling mechanism in the sense that you need a some kind of minimum standard, which you think everyone is a citizen, wherever they are, is entitled to. But then over and above that, that's where the space for uh, local control variety um, actually should, should come into play. Now, if, if that's what you're arguing for, what would be your view on, in terms of the leveling mechanism, being something like a universal basic income? Uh, would that be the kind of mechanism that you think should provide the leveling up? Or um, do you see the leveling up itself being provided through something which is more sensitive to the local context? 
so I, now there's a definite overlap with the idea of a of a universal basic income, and I can see the appeal. And I'm aware. I mean, I'm I'm trying to stay on top of the literature just like everyone else, and I'm aware that it seems to work in some places, and sometimes yeah. it doesn't seem to work. Uh, in principle, it sounds like an interesting thing to experiment with. Uh, as a kind of a top-down universal solution to a mm -hmm. general problem, I have a kind of an instinctive aversion to it. But I yeah. can see, th yeah, that's a kind of a, a streamlined way of creating that that platform, that that uh, rising tide to raise all the boats, uh, from which you can then really instigate proper localism and, and a bit more autonomy for individual communities. Um, there's other ways of thinking about leveling mechanisms, though. It's not always just to do with money or, 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 mm. uh, or wealth. It could also be to do with uh, other resources. Something we explored recently in, in a different report is this idea of, of time. Uh, now, it's something that emerged from especially the, the first lockdown here in the UK was suddenly a lot of people had way more time on their hands as a result of the furlough scheme. And, and also because we had an economic lockdown that made, you know, small businesses unviable for a while and that sort of thing. And what we'd learned from that was that people used quite a lot of their newly free time to contribute to their local neighborhoods. Now, who's to say that if we didn't try and create the conditions for that, that access to that resource of time, for freeing people up to, to be locally engaged, to be interested in their neighbors, that people wouldn't spend their time really improving the conditions, even in, even in places that are relatively more deprived. Mm. So there's all sorts of different ways of thinking about that leveling mechanism. And maybe there are lots of different ways to think about it. It's probably not just about income and wealth. Um, it's just, it, it is, it is clear to me, even if I don't have the solution, Mark, it is clear to me that different places, uh, if we have a purely kind of, um, if we have an archipelago, if you like, of, of very different approaches being pursued without any kind of uh, minimum standard, then you will see left behind getting more left behind. And that's obviously yeah. hugely important politically right now as well. So, but but speaking of that, I mean, you know, I mean, the government here is talking about a leveling up agenda. Um, I mean, in, is there any way in which what you're talking about can inform what that might look like? Um, it, you know, and, and how would you, can you give some specific examples of where you think perhaps there is scope for community control to facilitate leveling up, if that's, you know, what is currently being pursued? Yeah, well, so that I mean, I think there are some there are some abstract examples, but let me let me answer your question by talking about something that's playing out right now, uh, which is this towns fund concept, mm -hmm. which is which is being rolled out uh, from the MHCLG, the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government here in the UK. And uh, now this is quite a controversial scheme, partly because the selection of some of the pilot towns seem to be quite politically inspired, mm. Uh, mm. unsurprisingly, perhaps. But I have had an opportunity to talk to some of the people who are working on the approach being taken here. Uh, and there is scope for it to reflect people's ambitions and community intent on quite a granular level and for communities to be involved in the way those funds are disposed of when towns are selected and get involved in that they call it the town deal the, ta the deal making process so there is that yeah there are policy instruments here that could reflect even even within this leveling up agenda in particular places could put communities much more in the driving seat of how funds and how different levels of investment are are, are used a similar example, if you like, but one that doesn't emanate from government. Uh, one of the uh, partners on on the on the Think Big Act Small Ostrom report is uh, Local Trust, uh, who administrate the Big Local scheme. And Big Local, if, if if listeners haven't heard of it, is a really really exciting development. Um, and what they essentially do is they identify relatively deprived neighbourhoods all over England. And uh, they establish a steering group and, and, and kind of galvanize a local community, quite a geographically bounded local community. And they give them a pot of one million pounds to do with as they wish, really to do with as they wish. Very few strings attached. And some of the outcomes, as we explore in the report, are startling because communities don't waste this money. They value it enormously and they invest their time and that resource in, in really building up their local area to the benefit of everyone. Very excitingly, there are, there's even evidence in some of these places that the resources that are created from that investment then start being looked after by the community in a non-transactional way, in a kind of a self-governing way. So in one example, a green space gets created and there's 
at least anecdotal evidence that it's being policed, that it's being looked after by the local community. It's not it's not being run by the council. It's not being observed by any you know, contracted uh, department of anything. It's the communities and they have stakes in it and it changes their relationship to the place they live. And that's incredibly powerful. And what's the mechanism there for selecting the, the people who receive the funds? Is it, is it like people, do people advertise projects or you're literally giving the pot of money to, 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 to local actors and who are those actors, but they can just do it, do whatever they want with it. Is that, is that right? So in each place that they select, and the, I have to say the selection criteria I, I'm not expert on, and, and it's worth looking looking up yeah. uh, local trust and big local to see exactly how they make their decisions. But there's lots of these schemes playing out right now. The money comes from, I should add, the uh, community fund from the National Lottery. Yeah. Um, so there's 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 plenty to go around there. And when I heard about this scheme, I reversed my long-standing ban on buying lottery tickets because it's separate. <laughs> it is. It, it's uh, it's well worth taking that particular long long range risk. So. Uh, the the way they run these, it's really interesting because they, they go out of their way to make sure that local communities aren't just like handed a pot of money and say, okay, sort it out. There's a lot of, a, a lot of time is spent in sort of drawing together the community, drawing up plans, helping to facilitate the process of agreeing a, a way forward. Sometimes that's really easy and obvious and sometimes it's quite hard and there are, there are differences of opinion about where that money should be spent and how and, and that ties into long-standing grievances and very diverse communities and lots of stuff that Ostrom talked about actually in the way that common assets need to be run by, by localities. Uh, but in the end, most of these communities find a way to spend the money in a way that everyone can agree on. And they do that with support, but not direction from local government and from local institutions and businesses. And the range of things they do from setting up local assets to creating new public services to helping to invest in local businesses is really, really extraordinary. So, I mean, that the way you just described that, I, I, I remember very... Very well, there's a distinction that Ostrom draws, I think, in governing the commons between what she calls a facilitator state mm. and a controller state. So the way you just described that, if that if that's accurate, that sounds very much like a facilitator in the sense that uh, either resources or a framework within which resources can be distributed is provided. Um, but the way in which the funds are actually spent is very much left to local agents to determine for themselves. Yeah, exactly. And actually, we make a big fuss about facilitator and local, and we follow some yeah. of the secondary literature around Ostrom in this report by talking also at the other end of the scale about the risks of the totally uh, uh, absent state, the laissez-faire yeah. approach. Yeah. Um, so the facilitator state is a really interesting settlement somewhere here. And this is a little bit more familiar. This is a bit closer to the old third way, I suppose, mm -hmm. in, some, in some senses. But it suggests a role for the state that's neither about totally creating space to see what happens in a kind of wild west and it's not about trying to control and manage with the best intent in the world because that doesn't necessarily work very well either for well rehearsed reasons but rather trying to strike a balance where the first priority is to serve the interests as they are understood by the communities themselves not by some abstract notion of what people's real interests are and of protecting communities efforts from the overlapping interests of other communities or from outside agencies that could threaten the results of those, which is something that could become problematic if, if the state isn't interested at all. So yeah, there are lots of examples. So, and in each of the case studies in this report, Mark, the role of the state looked crucial. This was true for the big local examples. It was also true for the community businesses we looked at. Uh, community businesses, uh, don't have that initial kind of starting point of help. They have to kind of galvanize themselves. When they do, they tend to do a better job with whatever asset or local business uh, that they take on and control uh, for the local benefit. That's the definition of a community business. But to get to that point, they usually need to have developed a strong facilitative relationship with the local state at the very least. It's very hard for them to make headway if they can't do that. So it's a crucial relationship. And the fact that that relationship is so crucial is indicative of the power of the state in the contemporary UK. Well, I was going to say, I mean, you cannot, if you're starting from a position where the state, whether it's at the local level or at the national level, uh, is actually responsible for managing assets or resources, there's no way it can just disappear. Mm. At the very least, it needs a mechanism for transferring authority, however much authority we're talking about to other agents. So, um, yeah, you, you certainly, this, this is certainly not a, 
a laissez-faire approach. Um, but but to, to be honest, I mean, that would be true. I think someone who was advocating a laissez-faire approach even would have to recognize that if you're starting from a position where the state is already heavily involved, it can't just simply disappear. No. Some kind of governance procedure for moving towards something that is more uh, open-ended. Um, so let's, let's just move on to think about, I mean, obviously this discussion about localism is taking place at a particular point in time when you could argue that um, because of the problem that we're facing with the pandemic, um, localism is being thrown out of the window. Uh, <laughs> we, we have the ultimate example of arguably a problem which requires a centralized response because it's some kind of very large scale collective action problem where you can't have people just going on leading their own lives as though this virus wasn't out there mm. because of the risks that that poses to other people. Um, so how do you think, you know, the discussion that we've been having about the relationship between the center and localities plays out in the case of the pandemic? I mean, you did do, uh, listeners should know, quite an interesting blog post for us emphasizing that even in this context, we discovered that there's been a huge role for mutual aid at the local level, helping people to cope. And arguably, the centralized rules wouldn't have been able to function at all if it hadn't been for the fact that they are sort of operating alongside these local arrangements. Mm. Uh, and that sounds very much like to me an example of what Austin would call co-production. Mm. Both sets of rules, the local and the central, operating together. Yes, exactly. And it's that it's that overlap that's productive, because as you say, there are some challenges that are so big that it's it's unimaginable that you wouldn't want to have a national perspective on them or indeed an international perspective on them, a global perspective. But no, I so I, you're right. It's the there's something tragic. Well, there's a lot that's tragic about the pandemic. But one of the tragic things, extra tragic things about this pandemic is that we see a, a kind of a toxic combination, which is that this is a situation where local responses have in many cases been the best ones, where community led responses have sometimes been the most dynamic and the most effective, but also where, and I think we can probably sympathize with this instinct at least, where central government, Westminster and Whitehall have felt the need to take command and control of every situation as the crisis has developed because they haven't felt enough trust for local institutions and for communities to enable them to get on with the job themselves so there are all sorts of aspects of our pandemic response in this country and i think in some other countries that reflect the dangers of that over centralization the for example the the failure to galvanize a testing system uh, mm -hmm. relative to lots of other much less centralized countries reflects on the idea that we really did think for some reason that it had to be orchestrated and organized from the center. Uh, the fact that our test and trace beyond tr testing, the tracing program, tracking people, uh, keeping an eye on people, that's that's all revolved around central dictat rather than distributed responses. You look at the alternative and I mean, on paper, Germany, uh, contemporary Germany would be the worst country in the world to live in during a crisis like this because you think oh my god how are they going to coordinate their response each of those German federal regions has a veto over national policy in half the areas that are relevant to the pandemic but the opposite has been true because there's an overriding self-evident set of actions that need to be taken they found all sorts of ways to cooperate and coordinate and more importantly they've empowered local communities to respond and they've taken full stock of all the localized assets that have been available to them something we've been making a huge fuss about at new local over the course of the crisis is the idea that localized public health provision has been totally sidelined over the course of the pandemic and that's incredibly wrong-headed because these people don't just come in with epidemiological expertise. They also come in with a much deeper understanding of their own local areas. It's that localized knowledge that can make a difference when the order of the day is to understand how a virus might be spreading in a population. So like you say, there's, there's, there's something going on right now that creates a kind of apposite moment, I think, for making arguments about decentralization. And we are being reminded, I think like never before, just how centralized the UK is, not just in its structures, but in its instincts, in the way that Whitehall operates, in the way that politicians think, and uh, just how inappropriate that centralization is for getting things done. 
I think th this though really it feeds back into the the dilemma that I was hinting at earlier on in the the conversation, which is, I mean, obviously central government has um, acted in a very centralized way in, in this case, but isn't part of the reason that they've done that because there's been a popular demand for centralized action. It seems like the general public have not been clamoring for a decentralized response, um, even if maybe some local community leaders have thought that's more appropriate. Mm. The public opinion that the politicians seem to have been responding to seems to be one um, that very much values the idea of a strong national universal kind of an approach. So if you're actually trying to, um, I mean, this is almost sounding like a, you know, almost like a Foucauldian kind of point here. If you're trying to get out of um, a mindset, um, which is about centralization, when, when people are so embedded within the idea of centralization being the only, the only way to proceed, how do you do that? How do you break out of that discourse Mm. Of, of central control being the first thing that people uh, reach towards in a country that simply isn't used to exercising uh, more local responsibility. No, exactly. Yeah, no, uh, yeah. The the is the word governmentality. That's the. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I know you've been reading a lot of Foucault lately, uh, Mark. Uh, your your listeners may be surprised or unsurprised to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, no. I I think that's it. That is the the crux of the problem. Um, so first of all. Uh, I agree to some extent that people are clamoring for a strong national response. I think I was too. I think that's a natural response to a crisis on this scale. Um, uh, I think overall, well, though, the why, why is that, though, Simon? I mean, isn't that an interesting point? Why is it a natural response to a crisis of this kind to reach for central government measures? But it's, it's like I was just thinking about this. Um, I was talking to a colleague about climate change. And I think it's the same, the same thing happens here. We see a global problem or a massive problem. Mm. And we think global problems must have global solutions. Massive problems must have massive scale solutions. Little old me, I can't do anything. My neighborhood, my town, we can't fix nothing, right? But actually a lot of the time, the things that make the biggest difference personally, that set up the incentives to keep working locally, that's stuff that does function at a smaller scale. So global problems don't only have global solutions. Mm. And I think that's, that, is a, that is a counterintuitive uh, finding, mm. but is one that we can keep reflecting on. Uh, so I think that's true. Generally speaking, on public opinion, I do think that, generally speaking, people were interested in, in a strong national response. But I, I think the primary reason for that is because people wanted a strong response. I think that what the what we're learning about public opinion during this crisis is that people are very risk averse when it comes to the virus. I think uh, that's perfectly reasonable. Uh, and that people uh, want to see really strong measures in place to try, you know, at, at that and, to, and are willing to incur significant personal costs of all sorts of kinds in order to reduce personal risk and risk to people near to them. And I think that's all, that's all perfectly reasonable. It's just, as you say, it's our mentality, it's our culture that we think the way for this to be organized is from the center. Uh, actually, it's, I would argue, and I have argued, it's perfectly appropriate to take a different approach in a different place. Yeah. When Greater yeah. Manchester, before the, the second lockdown kicked in, and, and the context here is that, I don't know when this is going to go out, but we've just sort of entered this second lockdown phase here mm. for England. But before that kicked in, uh, Greater Manchester got into a massive argument with the central government, basically on the, on, on, on the argument that Greater Manchester isn't the same as everywhere else. We have mm. specific conditions that pertain here and we need a different set of settlements in order to make these, these measures work properly here. That sounds absolutely right to me. Um, and and uh, I think as we enter the second lockdown, and I'm not a lockdown skeptic, but as we mm. enter the second lockdown, there are plenty of parts of this country where it's a completely unnecessary measure. <laughs> and they, those people are paying more of a price, relatively speaking, than people in urban hotspots like my, myself, uh, who probably do need to live through a lockdown right now. If you've got an R number under whatever, and if you've got a handful of cases 20 miles away only, then I don't, I don't think it's necessarily right that everyone should live through exactly the same conditions. Mm. But that commitment to universalism runs, runs very deep. And how to fight that? You have to start doing things differently and just see if that sticks. Because Lord knows it works differently in different parts of the world. There's nothing natural or automatic about mm. the way we do things here. So you don't feel that um, what's happened with the pandemic is some kind of 
permanent setback to ideas about decentralization. You think that actually this is an opportunity to, to show what can be achieved by just trying to think in a different way. I, I really, really do think that, yeah. And I think, uh, I think, I think the, the, the better the job we do, organizations like ours do, of highlighting the extent to which uh, policy failure during this crisis has revolved around the kind of the, the universalization of, of, of bad decisions, the better the case for decentralization will become. Okay, well, on, on that note, Simon, I think that would be a, a good point to, uh, to conclude. I wonder if you could just maybe for the listeners benefit, just, just um, give us the title again of the report, which I actually, um, I use the old name for the report. And I know <laughs> you know, if you could just repeat that so that people can, can check it out. We will also put it up on our uh, website. We'll provide a link to it on our website so that people can check out this new report. But if you'd like to just let us know again what it's called. Yeah, of course. It's uh, so the, we're, this is a report by New Local. Uh, yeah. I'm Simon Kay. And the report is called Think Big, Act Small, Eleanor Ostrom's Radical Vision for Community Power. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, great to talk to you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Great to talk always, Mark. Thank you. Bye now. Bye. Bye.